Hello, everyone, once again, and welcome to the panel discussion, the potential of deep tech investments, expectation management. Well, you all know that deep tech is on the rise, and it is clear that investments there are a growing trend. But who are the major players in this area? And uh, what are their expectations? What are their agenda? And how to manage them uh, in order to achieve the best possible results in terms of solving global challenges, in terms of creating new markets, redefining boundaries, or offering new solutions? Well, in Europe only, deep tech startups received investments from 12 to 20 billion euros last year. And uh, worldwide, disclosed funding amounts increased from about 15 billion in 2016 to more than 60 billion in 2020. Well, it's obvious there is a potential, which is seen now by many more players. And the universe of funding providers is quite diverse. These are venture capital funds, these are private equity funds, business angels, corporate VCs, and of course, governments and institutions. And each of these players has their own expectations, have their own agenda. And our discussion today is aimed at how to manage these expectations so that investments into deep tech realize their full potential. And I believe this discussion also should take into account the perspective of the startup founders. And I'm really excited to listen to what the panelists are having to say. So we have a panel of distinguished speakers here. And they represent different players from uh, deep tech ecosystem. And I'm sure they're happy to share their views uh, and concerns and, of course, expectations with regards to deep tech investments. So, uh, our first panelist is the managing director of ICT Herman Hauser Management, who is responsible for the entrepreneurial programs, consulting, as well as setting a new projects on national and international level, fostering science-based entrepreneurship. So, Clara Brenstetter, welcome to the stage. Our next panelist is uh, in charge of venture capital measures at the local development financed institution through which large European Union funds are invested and in industries and private investments are attracted into industries as well. Uh, please welcome to the stage Eva Janssen Ibuka, member of the board of finance development institution Altum. Eva, welcome. The next person has over 25 years of professional experience on both sides of investment funds. With a PhD in chemistry, he has worked in two startups and his own consultancy in the field of chemo informatics, computer-aided drug design. He gathered more than a decade of industry experience in Hankel, and now he's heading the corporate venturing activities of Altana Group. So please welcome Dr. Thomas Kostka. Our next panelist is a science fiction fan who trusts the combination of human, science, and tech in the path to sustainable prosperity. For the last decade, he lives and breathes the startup scene in Estonia, and today he pioneers the Estonia deep tech startup ecosystem onwards as deep tech project lead at Startup Estonia. So please welcome Vaida Mikheim. And last but not least, a special advisor for innovation at NATO, working on the formation of Defense Innovation Accelerator for North Atlantic and the NATO Innovation Fund. Formerly, he was a visiting fellow at the MIT Sloan School of Management and research director at MIT Innovation Initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Lars Froland. So, dear panelists, welcome to the stage. And I will start with the first question, uh, probably from the public perspective, as this is probably the first tool that startups are using. 
So uh, more than 50% of deep tech startups having received grants requires several additional rounds of grants before they fail or attract a VC. Well, state and public institutions play here an extremely uh, important role, kind of de-risking uh, the, the, the investment objects for the next uh, level of investments. And uh, for deep tech startups, it's quite often uh, difficult to switch from grants into VC thinking, and they continue sticking to grants. So bo both public institutions and VC have uh, their own expectation, I believe, in this regard. So any solutions that you see to make this transition smoother, and maybe some have already been implemented, and I will probably start with, with Yeva, if, uh, if I may. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that grants are uh, initially a very good tool for those deep tech scientists and teams to learn how to operate and, and, and uh, run the funds. So when you transfer to VC and already investors' money, you already know that uh, there is a combination and a mix of not just the idea, but of, of the uh, initial things you need to achieve in order to also uh, provide the possible result on, and, and the return for your investment. And that means business case, accounting, etc. A lot of different things, and, and through grants and, and uh, operating these grants, and, and, and also uh, operating the, the technicalities that come along with public financing. You also learn uh, how to uh, operate in corporate world and under those uh, regulations, and, and, and some things that also uh, potentially investors will be seeking for this, this uh, returns and, 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 and so basically you turn not just to your fixing uh, not just to your idea but also to, to, to the, uh, this commercial part so basically uh, I believe that um, in, in Latvia case so we uh, have tried in previous generation when we launch uh, acceleration programs uh, to mix this element, that not to use it like a grant, but also, okay, seek for the technical uh, accounting, uh, reporting, etc., and also looking forward to, 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 to have a return on, on the initial investment. Yes, thank you. I do agree that uh, the acceleration programs that we run in Latvia have different elements actually to startups to get used to the VC thinking. Definitely agree with you. Uh, to, to switch to business thinking, not just creation of the ideas. True, very true. I see Thomas has uh, to add something and maybe to share some practical experience from Germany. Yeah, actually, I can give an angle how, how that topic is in, uh, tackled in Germany. So, yes, you, you have a university project, a not yet founded company, and you need some funding. In Germany, we have uh, one vehicle that's called Exist Funding. So, you don't actually have to be a, a legal entity as a startup already, so you can basically drag out your university commitment with other state funding and uh, to found the company. And then this kind of exist projects are already the pool for the next vehicle, which is the high-tech Gründer Fund. It's also co-founded by the government, but also with industrial investors, just like Altana and other uh, companies in, in many different markets. And there, basically, this is the, the local seed investment vehicle. There you need already your startup company, you need some IP, you need some business concept, but it's basically gradually from a technical approach at the university to more a business approach via these two vehicles. And this also probably uh, makes uh, next level investors more comfortable with the tech behind because they are already working together. And I see uh, that Lars wanted to add to the previous question, but we can also actually draw to this thing. So what kind of uh, expertise uh, VCs need to have in place in order to um, kind of invest more into deep tech? Because I believe this is kind of a common problem that they are a bit of uh, afraid of taking that risk on board. 
Okay, let me, let me start with the thing on the grants and then maybe get back to that specific question and if I can achieve it, try to make some kind of a bridge between the two of them. Uh, first of all, grants are fantastic. There's nothing better than non-dilutive. From a startup perspective, let's just admit it, it's fantastic. Um, and I think as you start getting into the venture capital world, you need to also make a couple of uh, decisions. One of the decisions is to be very much aware whether you're choosing are you a company that wants money? Or are you a company that wants uh, to work with a venture capital company that has a specific value team, for example, that are able to actually work with you afterwards? And I think when we talk specifically about deep tech, I think a lot of startups need to uh, recognize that they actually need to work with venture capital that is able to actually post investment to work very actively with them towards, you know, who are they as a leader? You know, a lot of these people come out of universities, they've never actually thought about, you know, now I'm a, now I'm a company. Um, so there's an enormous amount of things that you need to work with, and specifically also finding those initial sort of customers. Um, in terms of the venture capital uh, for deep tech, uh, a lot of the, the venture capital that is out there is uh, kind of a pure financial product. Um, and I think uh, it is important for deep tech that they in the way that they work, uh, sort of pre-investment, uh, have the abilities either in-house or obviously external. I think that's what venture capital is doing a lot. They have sub-advisors that will work uh, to do the due diligence. So I think that is obviously very, very important. But I think fundamentally, we need to look at venture capital as admitting that they're also taking significant technological risk. So that actually means that after post-investment, they also need to actually still have people that are very technical, maybe even with PhDs in a particular area in the quantum field, try to work with these people or connect them to these people. So in that sense, it becomes a different type, I think, of, um, of organization. And it's not a pure sort of financial product that is obviously out there. So I think that, that, that's, that's super important. And last part, on the bridge between the grants and to the, to the, sort of, to the funding, um, there's a lot of ways to bridge that. There's convertible notes and et cetera, which is often used in the accelerators. One of the things that I think this could be actually quite interesting is that you often go from grants to convertible note, but what you could also do is actually start by having a convertible note, and if it doesn't work out, you convert it into a grant. And we're actually seeing a lot of institutions trying to do that because then it becomes less risky. So start with the convertible note that then actually becomes a grant if it doesn't work out. Very interesting, thank you. I see Vido has to add something, and then Clara. Yeah, very quickly, since the question was about transition from grants to, to next rounds, and something to follow on what Lars said is that grants are great, and occasionally we forget to utilize the grants as a means to, to the next phase by saying that if somebody has given us a grant, the more competitive the grant is, the, the higher it is from the financial size, then you can utilize it and say that, hey, you see, some guys already believe into us. Some risks are already mitigated. Quite often the same technological risk that Lars mentioned, that the research behind it is solid. So use the grant. That's true, that's true. Clara? I think it's quite important in this case as well to basically distinguish what I want to achieve with the grant because you have really grants specifying on the de-risking of the technology. And of course, it's like a more strict scheme there. But then, of course, um, for example, in Austria, you have um, grant schemes which are really targeting um, more towards the commercialization, where the technology development is not the core focus anymore. And I think in, in both cases, the reporting structures and as well the, the documentation, the, the house the entrepreneurs need to be set to those targets, that's quite a critical point because sometimes like over-reporting can literally kill startups. And another point, especially on these grants focusing on the more like commercialization area, um, there I think the, the VCs have one added, um, like added advantage. It's basically the network that you had been adding to because quite some people in the government or like in these positions who deliver those grants or who do the decisions over those grants, they might not have those insights on the market or the network to really um, have the same potential as if you would have been into an NBC. And I think you asked as well about like um, possible suggestions, how to like make this one better. 
Um, I think if VCs, business angels, experts are already more integrated in the decision making on especially commercialization grants, that would be helpful because then you basically merge these two worlds in there already and like leverage the potential these grants enable. Definitely, I agree to you, and uh, they, they feel more safe. I mean, if they uh, are integrated, if they, let's say, involved uh, earlier and uh, kind of follow the development, then uh, they, they feel more safe also to invest. Uh, well, um, corporate VCs are uh, extremely important player in deep tech. So I think every deep tech startup is actually dreaming of having an industrial pilot with some of the big industrial players. So, Thomas, probably the first question to you. Well, uh, CVCs uh, have the capacity to make a proper due diligence, yeah? But how, in reality, uh, this integration of new technologies happen? Because there probably there is a resistance inside the big corporations of bringing something which is not invented there. And um, probably um, startups are also not very much open to disclose everything, all of the pluses and minuses of their solutions. So how you see that? So what are the expectations of the CV CVCs as they, are, uh, they have become the, one of the imp most important players uh, in order to help deep tech startups to develop? Yeah, it's certainly right. I mean, Established corporations just already have that route to the market. So if a startup develops something where a sales force, a network is already there, why not partner up? That's the logic behind it. And um, I think that the next logical step is to realize that to do that, you don't even need an investment. You just need a partnership and to the given sort of set of circumstances. This could be just a commercial agreement. This could be developing something together. And if it's in a strategic yeah, field for the corporate, where I'd say overproportional growth expectations live, then we would also invest. And you're absolutely right. There's, I mean, it's like cogwheels uh, sometimes turning with different speed. Uh, you have to have some unit between those two cogwheels to, to match the speed and uh, sort of work on reducing friction in that uh, gear house. And that is on the corporate side, it's, it's a cultural change. So you can't just say, now we're doing open on, uh, innovation. It's something, I was once asked, how do you do this? And in, in German, zu Fuß. So you have to walk it. You really have to build a personal relationship with this R&D unit, with that R&D unit, with that division head, and so on. And this is something that, that has to change over time in every corporation. This is not something you just change because you want to change. On the startup side, it's, I, I mean, I think it's really on, on that interface in between, it's managing expectations on both ends. Because some things in a big company you won't speed up, and yeah, and expectations on the startup side could be different. Yeah. Clara, I have a question to you. As uh, you also run a platform where you bring together startups with uh, industrials, with investors, how do you see uh, this perspective in do you see more and more pilots uh, uh, emerging or there is still a kind of a resistance to that from the industry side? Um, what we have realized like in Austria and our environment a lot more corporates want to have like um, corporate venture activities or corporate innovation activities mm. and I think they're yeah they're there are a lot of challenges. I think it's amazing to see how it's starting off. Um, regarding the topic of like being corporate partner, like cope, um, like being a proto customer, I think that's a lot of cultural issues, like how to really get into the corporate, do you find the perfect match in there to really co-create it. And I think that's something where the corporates have certain cultural and performance management topics in place. I think the other topic is where really um, corporate venture capital appears. That's becoming a little bit more crucial because are these corporates then financial investors and purely giving money? Do these corporates focus as well on like um, entering a new business unit with that startup? And then the question arises for the startup, if I have one corporate in my cap table, how does it look like 
with my competitive environment. And especially in the deep tech area, a lot of um, innovations and startups do disrupt it, do become new standards, and basically should be kind of like the Swiss, be neutral, be a Swiss knife, um, to be as flexible as possible. And if I have like one main player in my cap table already, what does it mean? So I think in the deep tech environment, um, for startups in the deep tech area, corporate venture capital are definitely two question marks to think about like in depth. And I would be really interested what like your take is from a VC perspective or even from a corporate venture capital perspective, what uh, pearls and pitfalls did you already realize in the, the previous months, years? Yeah, I can quickly comment on this. I mean, obviously, yes, the moment you, you have a strategic player entering the cap table, the, the perception of the rest mm -hmm. of the VC world is limiting the exit value. But that you have to sort of counterway um, against the fact that you're now building momentum in the market faster than you could alone. And uh, I'm, I'm, for example, I'm sitting on a board of uh, an Israeli startup where we're sitting with our direct competitor in additives. So it's sometimes it's just the more the merrier. <laughs> but I, I obviously you have case by case that mm -hmm. initial concern, but it's uh, something that the startup and the startup board has to just weigh against each other. Because if you want to sell a product and you're in a very established market, you have to build that route to market. Do you want to build that 100% on your own? Yes or no? And then uh, what's the next best approach is the strongest partner you can find. And then you have the one corporate helping basically accelerate on the end. Yeah, that's clear. Yeah. But to be very fair, it's also, I mean, uh, we're also very transpar transparent in, also it's, it's on a case by case thing, but uh, usually our exit scenario that we favor most is you, you're successful and then we try to acquire you. Obviously that would be for fair market value, so we would be bidding against our competitors, but we would establish ourselves already as the corporation partner. And if you're gonna be asked on the startup side, uh, who, who want to, uh, basically, where do you want to sell your company to, then you have somebody you know already and you're already working with uh, together. And this is basically the, the the advantage that we're trying to push with the strategic investment. That's uh, very true. I would agree that also the majority of the, our, our portfolio companies is seeing their own exit as, as a trade sale to an industrial player. That's, that's really true. I see Lars has something to add to this discussion. So it was just on the point on, on, the, on the value of a startup working with corporate venture capital. And I think it's just it's super important to say, at least from my perspective, is that a lot of these things is actually about building solutions that become impactful. So in that sense, one could say, okay, it's fine with the startups, but you know, I actually want impactful solutions. And if that means that you need to work with an incumbent that actually has the infrastructure to get it out there, to actually build the solution to become impactful, that is exactly what we need to do. Because I think if you look into many of these areas that are quite technical, that is highly regulated, you actually need to work with the incumbents if you are not you know, completely disruptive and can't wait 15 years. You need to work with the ones that are actually there. And if you look at some of the corporate venture capital, especially in the energy sector, that are investing, they're investing exactly into those companies where they can contribute with that or something that is completely outside of their current scope, but they need to be there in 20 years. Uh, the classic example is uh, ENI, the Italian energy, uh, state energy company, which was one of the first investors in Commonwealth Fusion Systems one of the startups that came out of, uh, of, of, uh, of MIT that was uh, also part of something called The Engine, uh, also at MIT. And their round B was $1.8 billion. Very so I also nice just want to highlight another thing that we haven't talked about is that deep tech can be highly valuable, right? It can actually, when there is a breakthrough, you, know, it can, you can actually earn a lot of money. And I'm saying that because there is sometimes this tendency to think about deep tech as only being sort of kind of an impactful altruism, right? We want to do this because we want to save the world. But if we don't at the same time get rid of this sort of binary world of saying we only want impact but we can't earn money, if we can't get the two to actually work together, which is completely possible, then we won't get the current venture capital and the financial markets to chip in here. I think that's important. So not to live in binary worlds, but see they can actually support each other. 
Let's come back a bit to the governments. Uh, they are really important players, not just de-risking with the grants, but they are kind of also setting the scene. They are bringing the rule of the games, and there are many states that, states that have now declared that deep tech is uh, their priority. And uh, what are the expectations of the states saying that, and how they actually can help this whole environment? So maybe Vida would start with this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a good question. What are the expectations of the state? And this could be answered in a multiple ways, of course, uh, ranging from conspiracy theories to you know taxes paid and and uh, economic welfare and the uh, you know impactful and good solutions out there. So uh, I will actually answer it the way Lars answered. It's always good to piggyback on a you know respectable opinion. In that case, you have to disagree with me and him at the same time. So deep tech can be profitable, it can be lucrative, and it can have an impact. So if done right, and if it's really successful, then it can bring a lot of benefits. And that's on a, like the simplest way, a nut nutshell, why actually governments are betting on it. Yeah, well, what's your take on that? Yeah, exactly. So basically, our role is to fulfill this market gap where needed. So basically, if we see that there is a potential and, and coming back a little bit to uh, what venture capital, how to evaluate those potential of deep techs. So our role is to provide the funding and to, 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 to foster the, the ground as such. So basically, then comes uh, the VC funds, the GPs, which are professionals and what they do. So please foster with grants, with, with blended instruments, etc. But our goal is to see that uh, the industry or the market in which, uh, at least currently in Baltic, the early stage financing is sufficient, but, but uh, the problem is have to uh, come to this early stage financing, how to grow those initial ideas, and that is currently what what, what the reactors and accelerators are, are, are doing, in, and that is also where we see this, this uh, potential of, of our, our f f footprint in, 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 in that area, through grants, through blended instruments, etc. Yeah, I agree, definitely, uh, especially regarding the blended instruments. And why I also see the role of the state is uh, kind, of, kind of setting these rules and uh, maybe providing the incentives uh, for those willing to cooperate. And this cooperation, as you are saying, is, is uh, really essential uh, to, uh, to bring uh, valuable results. Uh, let's say... Um, creating the transparent rules for uh, IP transfer from uh, uh, from academia to uh, to the markets, uh, facilitating the cooperation between different types of players, creating these incentives for startups. Well, the perfect uh, example is our startup law, which is. Uh, uh, really beneficial for startups, and I know that many of the players in our market use this. Um, all right, we have another expectation, this time to market expectation. So um, I assume we still have this problem here, as uh, many, uh, for instance, VC funds uh, uh, tend to invest too quick in order to fulfill LP's expectations, and they tend to exit too early as, again, to provide this uh, profits to the LPs and maybe when the startups have not fully realized their potential. So uh, what's, what's your take on that, uh, how this uh, expectation can be managed and maybe something uh, that you would think as a solution to this? Anyone? Thomas? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we can all agree that uh, deep tech developments take more time than scaling up a software idea. And this is where you have the clash with the regular VC world, with a fund lifetime, typically five years investing, then five years divesting. And uh, so what if it takes another two or three years now? It just doesn't fit the scheme, the traditional scheme. So and I think there's, uh, I mean, you see in the market di different ways how to deal with that. And uh, one way, it's all, I mean, either you go closer to the market, you wait until the product is already there, and you can talk to customers that are willing to sell the product in, let's say, 
18 months already, then you can still run your five years investment period for a closed fund. And there's examples uh, in, 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 in the VC community doing exactly that. But you still need the sector know-how. You can't just invest because uh, you have re uh, re uh, read a book about uh, science, right? It's, you need, you need the, that deep sector knowledge and that you have to build with experience. The other way to skin that is to start very early with, with really minimum investment, getting a bit of equity, and there's, for example, Cottonwood is an example for that. They invest early before anyone other does, and they don't invest in the Bay Area, they don't invest in New England states, they invest in Texas, somewhere in the, uh, in, uh, or in, in Europe, at very early projects, and then they fund it and they don't care if it takes another year or three. But they, they invest in platform technologies that can have multiple applications with the assumption one of them will finally find their way into the market and they take then also strategic investors on board on, for that journey. But it's different approaches to the classical VC theme. That's, That's for sure. Clara? <laughs> but isn't it rather that Basically, venture capital, who is like quite a, in a, is working in a disruptive industry, but venture capital himself is not disruptive itself. It still has this like this classical five years investing, five years harvesting, right? And isn't it a time that, especially in deep tech, um, we already stated it's more about the tech rather than the investment, right? And it's rather as well about like. Being, being partnering up with the startups and providing network expertise, especially post-investment. Yeah. So being in there early is super um, important. And then like staying there and harvesting there and thinking about new models of investing. I think Sequoia, they launched quite a new model, was it one year ago? Basically kind of a fund of, fun, like simply stated yeah. fund of fund principle. I think in other um, countries it's possible to have even things structured, structured like evergreen funds where it's possible to really stay in there and support from the super early stage and wait when there's best scale, uh, like when there's like the, the highest scalability because the, the first um, direction you mentioned where you wait, for example, to get in I think we currently see the different dynamic as to get in as early as possible mm. because it's a really competitive market currently, especially the last two to three years where so many new investors and good projects appeared. So I, I don't think um, to, it's, like, it's possible for a VC to wait that long to get in there. Um, but like I've seen possible reactions from that side here. Yeah. <laughs> Lars, go ahead. No, no. I completely agree. I, I think what we're talking about here is some, some called it by the notion of patient capital, right? So, and uh, it's kind of interesting because after spending so uh, significant amount of years in, in, in the United States, you sort of at some point realize that one of the most patient capital providers in the United States is the Department of Defense, uh, especially by, by through DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, which made some of the earliest investments in, you know, GPS, drones, 2013, they also invested in two companies doing something science fictional called, called mRNA. 2013, they invested in two companies, Moderna and CureVac. Everybody said that were, that was ridiculous to do that. We're very lucky they did that. So I think just making the point of the patient capital, and I think maybe taking a more European angle, I think we should ask ourselves, uh, are governments in a sufficient way seeing themselves as taking that mission for their local country, for their regions, for Europe in general, and being that patient capital provider? Are there stakeholders, I'm saying this rhetorically, <laughs> of course, I think, are there stakeholders like the pension funds, the high net worth individuals, the family offices, that I still think we need to get a little bit more into this game I still think it's, it's kind of ridiculous, to be very frank, that some of the major investors as LPs uh, in, in Europe are American pension funds. Like, where are our own money, right? This is the welfare state. If we are to compete as Europe, let's use a, a position of strength, which is our welfare state. And a lot of those money is actually in our pension funds and in our family offices. So that's at least one answer, is that how do we 
manage the expectation of that timeline is to have actors, the LPs, that can actually have that timeline and then set up the fund manager accordingly. Well, what I see from uh, the statistic reports that uh, more and more pension funds are investing in uh, high-risk uh, high risk companies, so, mm -hmm. which is happening already, but again, it's like with the culture in the CVCs, uh, it's not happening over months or half a year. It will take some time, but at least the trend is there. I see, I see Vido is, uh, is, is willing to say he's waiting too yeah, long. Yeah, I wanted to echo exactly what Lars brought out there that time to market, it can also translate time to result. And if you're looking at it, the governmental point of view or state point of view, that uh, there is definitely an expectation from time to result. And it's even shorter than in VC's case, because we can all agree that, do we agree that it takes more time? We all say yes. And then comes the next election, and you know, everything is clean again from the table. So this patient capital, and, and also for, especially from the governmental side, the ability to wait longer than three years before you know, shutting down a program and launching a new one is super important. And uh, that was separates you know, good ecosystems from very good ecosystems. Like the DARPA case was ex excellent because they have patience. They understand that it will bring back Israeli have the same case, uh, and in Europe we have also a few cases, which brings actually to a dimension that how to meet the expectations. Technology usually doesn't have expectations. Capital by itself doesn't have expectations either. It's humans. Humans are the you know, problematic part. Humans have expectations, especially if they are somehow time constrained. And how to deal with humans, especially in a like, long tail game, which is deep tech, it's communication. You have to talk. Your annual status update is not enough. You have to talk more often and you have to explain, especially if it's a complex issue. So um, I think there is a lot to do still. I totally agree with you. Uh, I see that uh, Eva has uh, to add something to that and probably with regards to also the new uh, generation programs that are being developed in Latvia, uh, there is also this uh, time to market expectation aspect. Yeah, I think governmental uh, institutions and money provided from from state and and, and Europe uh, is is there to to, to uh, foster the, the very early pre-seed stage and, and acceleration and maybe even step back to to like cooperation with universities etc to foster those ideas. Uh, regarding next generation, yes, that is something that we address there as well. So. So, so basically, uh, yeah, and, and other aspect is to to be with a company, to be with a fund for sufficient uh, time for them to have like uh, normal VC round and, and not to leave them in, a, in, in like in a gap of where they are not still marketable and, 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 and not uh, not able to, to, to go to uh, normal or, or market VC players and, and uh, yeah not to leave them without any funding. So that is also the second uh, uh, things that we will be addressing in, in the next stage to, 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 to enlarge our ticket sizes, to, to be with the company for as much as needed, but one good point is that, that that time is not like without the limitations. So for sure, there is a program's money comes with its own rules and, and, and restrictions. So some some timing uh, will will be there for sure. It's it's uh, it's not so easy as like with. I don't think it's also very easy with the private investors that he can wait forever. Yeah, but but with governmental institutions, those limitations will be in place and quite strict in in, in the beginning. Well, I wouldn't agree that a private investor would wait forever. It again depends on their own expectations. Yeah. But well, let's imagine that the pool of investors is growing and they are all are investing. Um, let's say mostly direct to direct equity, maybe convertible loans, but what's your take on uh, the variety of instruments they can be used more in deep tech area? Uh, I hear a lot about the revenue sharing models. Uh, uh, what's your opinion on what kind of other instruments, uh, maybe a bit of alternatives to the direct equity uh, investments can be used, and uh, what's your take on that? Let's start with Lars, maybe. Hmm. 
I'm, I'm actually going to answer the question, but I'm going to answer the question in a way where I actually don't think that we can sort of come up with a new financial instrument, like, I don't know, a hybrid something that will solve the problem. I still think that there are some fundamental problems that we need to solve, which is, for example, uh, come out of a, of a research lab, you go from a grant, you get your first uh, VC fund, you become a legal unit, oh, now we can't have access to your lab any longer. Like, let's start by actually just pinpointing the things that are, you know, you know just take these things away first, right? So that you're just out of a lab, you're now a legal entity, and now you can't actually have access to your lab any longer. And if you're in biotech or anywhere, it's very hard to find an investor with a lab, right? <laughs> Maybe, right? Yes, CVC. Yeah. Exactly with my exactly point. The infrastructure, right, is there, right? But still, we should be able to provide that. And then the only thing I also just want to say is like, there's a tendency also from a lot of governments to say, okay, let's enhance the production of science, let's be better at commercialization, you know, let's do another review of the technology transfer offices, right? I think at the same time, they're not tackling some of the main points that they need to do as a government, which is to be a sufficient demand signal. There's nothing better for a startup than having a customer. There's nothing better from a private investor to be patient if there's a customer. Even so, actually looking into procurement rules, procurement regulations, how states can actually buy uh, prototypes and participate in all that, and in that sense, providing a very clear demand signal would create a lot of, uh, take a lot of friction away. So I didn't answer your question, because I actually don't think that it's just another financial product. I think there are other things we need to do before we do that. Very true from this aspect as well. Clara? May I add something to this? Basically, you're referring to structural issues, and we have been working on this in the last um, years in um, Austria quite heavily, especially this topic of, in deep tech, the main asset often is the patent, right? And the shelf life of a patent is a clicking talk, or like It's like a, a ticking clock, so this means it needs to be quite fast that you get that patent out. However, um, in lots of um, universities and um, research structures, it takes ages until it is defined what the worth of this paid, and, it, and then it's like about negotiation of like 5, 7, 10, 15, I don't know, sometimes open just like a little bit of percent, instead of just saying, okay, these are the standards, you will be safe in there, it's a framework, just go ahead. That would be like of added benefit for all of us, because at the end it's like the result and the amount of spin-offs and startups, and we are create, creating, so like a kind of um, frameworks to make it easier for universities as well to get out there. And then as well, of course, um, topic of financial literacy to educate more people that basically investing is a possibility, that all even like um, smaller amounts are feasible to do, to incentivize it with taxes. That takes, for example, ages in our case. And one last point, but I think that's a super critical one, is the topic of talent. I think we have a crucial shortage of talent. And um, to incentivize those people, like ESOPs are like a good possibility. However, in some countries with taxation, ESOP is not attractive at all, or it takes you ages until you get the respective people in there. So I think identifying a couple of these drivers might already, or not only identifying, but really, I think the identification is here, but really implement um, quick wins in there might already put us ahead of the game. And I can only speak from our experiences, what we have in Austria and with the startups we are working with. They are quite international, but in depth with the Austrian ones. And I'm not sure how it's like in Latvia or so on, um, but that's something we definitely need to learn from each other and implement the, the best case scenarios. Totally agree, and uh, I believe that in order to actually develop this talent, uh, we can all work together. I mean, uh, governments, uh, public institutions, private sector, and uh, we can uh, train and maybe cherry pick those talented people who can actually come into the deep tech area and become deep tech entrepreneurs. Uh, this is something definitely that is being done already here in Latvia and uh, not just in Latvia but in, in, in other European countries. But Clara, you have actually tapped on a very important topic uh, regarding the teams uh, within the deep tech startups uh, and every player of the deep tech ecosystem expects something from the teams. So can we start with Vido? What would be your expectations for, from the 
Yeah, Perfect I was just thinking that team. Clara was uh, explaining about the talent. So uh, let me ask from the audience who is hiring or who needs people in their team right now, like hands up. <laughs> okay, relatively few hands, so it seems my assumption was wrong. But at least in Estonia, what I see that um, if I would go with a, like a bag of money or a good person, then people or the teams would choose a good person. So uh, hiring HR is a major pain in the bottom. So I fully agree with Lars that we should actually solve a couple of the very pragmatic problems looking from the startup side or from the deep tech team side, because uh, they are competing with very well capitalized competition. We have plenty of unicorns, even in Baltic states, we have plenty of unicorns and they are hiring by floors. And now you're a weak, like three or four co-founder team and you need to find those people in as well. Uh, and it's difficult and then there is like the only expectation management that you can do is that start yesterday, build the community, be active in your community that the, the, when the day arrives when you need to hire, you are already recognized in your field. So um, it's a hard work. You have to kind of recognize that it's hard work. And uh, I don't know, pray or do whatever rituals you do for good luck and hang on to the good people. Thomas, what would be your expectation from a perfect deep tech uh, startup team? On the team side, I, I give two answers. One before the investment and one after the investment. Before the investment, it's, I mean, it's all about communication. The soft facts that you want to have an open conversation, what is possible, what's not. You don't want to find out things yet that you could have been told before, right? That would be on the before the investment side. And after the investment, it's really, I mean, it's not a question if challenges arise. It's just the question when and when do we start talking about it. And uh, the sooner we start talking about the problems on the table, the sooner we can be working on them, right? I think that's my, my main expectations on the team side, to have that sort of click together that I trust the person on the other side of that conversation to deliver on those both ends. Lars, you are setting up uh, a fund currently. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably you have some expectations from the team you know, in which you will be investing. Yeah, and uh, I think, it, so first of all, I've, I've worked with a lot of teams sort of previously, and I think every team is very different. And... Uh, you kind of know it when it's right, uh, in a way. Uh, what I expect from, from, from most of the teams that we'll be working with is a ridiculous amount of, uh, of ambition uh, to really, you know, focus on the, on, the, on the hard problem, right? You know, what was the problem of the internet? That was search. Somebody figured that one out and got the market. That was Google, right? There's a lot of other things. So if you don't, haven't nailed it down, within a specific technology, what's the actual hard problem, right? And there's this uh, whole saying from, uh, I think it's Astro Teller from, from Google X, who sort of tells this story about if you were to uh, put a monkey on a pedestal reading Shakespeare, how would you go about it, right? And in most organizations, maybe in most teams, you know, you'll go about building the pedestal, right? Because that's the way you show progress. But actually knowing that the real, the hard part is getting the monkey to read Shakespeare. And in most of these technologies, uh, where it's quantum, whether it's AI or it's autonomous systems, there is a critical, critical problem to solve. And like, just focus on that. Get that monkey to read Shakespeare. And that's the only thing that you need to do. So when I was at MIT, we talked about the kill uh, it's always about killing, the kill project, right? So, for example, a PhD student had three months to prove to be wrong. And you work relentlessly to kill your own project, to, to prove that I'm wrong. And that was the only way that you make progress. So that type of, like, extreme sort of focus on the inherent problem that's, that's within what you're trying to do, because otherwise a lot of hedging is going on. And if hedging can go into, let's get some more grants and let's just get going, instead of focusing and, and really saying, if I can't solve this, let's do something else. All right. Um, Eva, Altum is not investing directly into teams, but through intermediaries. But you obviously have your own view on that. Uh, what would be a perfect team in your mind? I was uh, yeah, listening to Lars and considering exactly that we are not directly investing, but I think the team is, is 
a match of, of different types of personalities. So, so what needs to be addressed for good startup to, to, to be successful is ideas, implementation, it's sales, it's, it's communication, it's, it's technical reporting, accounting, etc. which in our case is, 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 is uh, an important question in order to, to facilitate those grants, etc. So if there is a, um, and it can be like uh, one person or two persons with all those qualities, so basically, you need to address each of those as a critical, critical streams that you that you have to work in. And, and uh, well, good team is like a perfect marriage. It's it can happen. Very, very true. <laughs> uh, my next question, again, continuing on this team topic. Uh, when talking to different types of investors, I see that I identify narrative as a problem, so that these deep tech startups, they are more focused on explaining how the technology works, what's inside that. And they are kind of lacking this narrative uh, to make this uh, solution really cool. So how do you see that? Uh, whether this is an issue, so would, would you expect uh, a greater narrative, uh, a greater story behind uh, that startup or not? Maybe, Clara, we can start with you, because you see lots of interaction uh, between startups and investors and industries. We did, yeah, exactly. We had like two or three weeks ago, we have like had a strategy recap as well with our Cambridge mentors. And we realized one critical issue is this topic of storytelling, how to really tell your story. Because if you enable other people to understand it, you basically bring more people on board. So um, to support the researcher becoming as well a storyteller. So that's one topic. And I think the, the critical assumption or underlying assumption behind it is that you don't start with techno technology, but rather search what problems slash opportunities are there and are these big problems? Are these like problems targeting millions of people? Because then it's possible to create something big out of it. And um, an American entrepreneur, um, I forgot his name, it's Navida or something, okay? He said it's not about like curing the symptoms, but really curing the problem. And I think if you understand to tell a story about it, um, then it's easier to transfer actually your technology and make your startup or venture successful. So we really want to incorporate, incorporate it now even more um, to enable um, founders to tell their story. Yeah, Vaida? I have developed a, a little bit different uh, take on this one, and this is one of the few issues where I a little bit disagree with Lars, is that especially in the deep tech field, I see that we do not start from the problem because there is a 10, 12, whatever, five, six, seven, eight years research behind it. So you have a solution. You have ready built solution and now you're starting to search to which problem my solution fits best. And quite often there are multiple problems there and you have only resources for one ticket or for one card. So um, it's difficult to choose the right problem. And, uh, and that's, you know, the riverbed where it goes is different, whether I'm choosing, you know, the airports or whether I choose actually how to measure the bridges. So the team building everything kind of switches around, but the, the solution might still be the same. But that also gives you an opportunity to pivot, let's say, if uh, first uh, solution to that particular pro program uh, doesn't work, then you can actually move into the other. And of course, if you still have funds, if you still have the motivation to go, but we've seen many examples to that, yeah. And this is where I see the gap, so I try to be really short since our time is running out, that we do not provide sufficient funding, especially for very early stage teams, to do this uh, problem solution discovery or, or like um, market discovery. That where does my solution fit best? Because usually the problem doesn't live like 50 kilometers from you. It lives somewhere else, or at least in quantity, it lives somewhere else. So that's where we could come in and, and incentivize or find extra measures. Lars, what's take on that? I think actually we, we, we completely agree. I think there's just a point where they need to be very defined on, on, the, on the problem that you're then trying to solve as you become a company. But it's, it's clear, you know, um, nobody asks for a bike. 
Nobody asked for drones. There was no procurement process. We had identified a problem. Let's, you know, write out the solution that we didn't want to buy. So I think there is a fundamental issue, which is uh, ensuring, by the way, and, and I think this is at least very important for me to say, as well as a background in research, is to say the fundamental sort of, you know, the, you know, you can't do all these things if you also are, you need to invest in this more curiosity-driven research. It's like it's fundamental. Uh, and Herman Hauser, uh, in very, very early on, started investing around Cambridge and obviously created Amadeus Capital. It also came out of a curiosity, but I can see that, but actually it's one of the earliest, by the way, investors in deep tech, right? It is, you know, you still need to have this curiosity-driven uh, driven research, and uh, it is not all researchers that needs to become an entrepreneur, by the way. Right? It's just, just very, very important to say. So, but there needs to be a handover when we've got something great. Yeah. Thomas, anything to add regarding yeah, this? So I put myself on the other side of that uh, discussion, and uh, I mean, Fundamental research, yes, we need it, but when you work in a, in a big company, uh, I like that uh, pain point in the market to be really addressed by a startup's technology because, quite frankly, we have enough technology looking for a problem with our own research, right? So I, I'd rather start from a market need. Uh, I think it could be both approaches, and uh, I know that uh, Europe alone has uh, produced uh, more than a third of all the scientific papers in deep tech, but uh, there is huge potential actually lying in the European academia, but Europe is still uh, hasn't managed to create this competitive advantage in the tech uh, globally, so this is something uh, definitely to be done uh, there, and I think our discussion here today I've managed to kind of highlight some important points where to look for uh, new opportunities, for new funding, how to actually uh, manage expectations best and how to um, come to better results uh, in deep tech. I really would like to thank you all for this uh, extremely interesting discussion. I really enjoyed it uh, a lot, and I hope the audience here as well. So really, uh, thank you so much, and uh, let's cooperate. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.